Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. The webinar today is Agile Test Management using JIRA and Zephyr. Myself, Philip Liu, and we've got Chris Bland here. Hi, Chris. How are you doing this morning or this afternoon? Hi, Phil. It's afternoon where I am. I'm doing great, thank you. Great. Um, so today we're going to be, we're going to have a really cool webinar with some hands-on stuff with Chris talking about how Agile Test Management and the problems in Agile Test Management are handled with Zira and Zephyr. And I'll also be talking about some issues and problems in Agile Test Management in general and then how these problems are solved by, by Chris and his firm at BDQ. Uh, Chris, why don't you just keep going there? My, just a short introduction to my company, XBOSoft. We were founded in 2006 and we specialize in helping firms solve their software QA problems, first starting off with a lot of consulting and working with them on process improvement, and then actually helping them with the actual execution of software testing, which as you can imagine, oftentimes results in a lot of JIRA optimization and, and configuration. We've got offices in San Francisco as well as in Beijing. I have been stuck here in San Francisco for about three to four months, and who knows when I'll be able to get back to Beijing. Uh, Chris is going to give an introduction to himself on, on BDQ. Chris, why don't you talk about your company a bit? Yeah, sure. We uh, Thanks, Phil. Uh, we are an Atlassian solution partner based in the UK. Our background was uh, software development. We had some tools in the data quality space. Um, we have, in fact, we're just releasing a new add-on into the marketplace now. Uh, we are Agile and JIRA experts. We have very good experience in the whole uh, Atlassian solution stack uh, with customers like Clarks, BBC, uh, Betway, Direct Line, and so forth. Uh, we're an approved training partner so for Atlassian. So we train people, we provide consultancy, we help them with best practice and implement the Atlassian tool stack and other associated tools. Uh, we also deal things with things like uh, CI and CD. CI, CD, for example, we're dealing with um, Azure, a particular customer right now to do Azure DevOps. So yeah, if it's to do with uh, building or testing software using the Atlassian stack, uh, we're good people to come to. We're based in London in the UK. Uh, just a quick thing here, you know, you're, you're going to be getting a uh, recording of the webinar. Chris, we are recording, right, just in case? We are indeed, yes. All right, okay. And feel free to ask questions in the questions panel for the GoToWebinar question panel. And uh, let's move on with it. Uh, just another quick introduction to myself. I have uh, I love cycling and travel, and I work on the side. So that's pretty much <laughs> about me. I, I try to do as little work as possible and try to do as much cycling and travel as possible. But uh, in between, I have gained quite a bit of experience in software quality process improvement and in particular in measurement of software quality. Um, I've got actually a lot of experience from my sins in building software using, you know, tools like uh, Excel and Delphi to try and manage things and CVS back in the day all the way through to now thankfully distributed um, systems, uh, Java, JavaScript, etc. etc. Um, Along and you own a bull to... mastiff. You have a bull mastiff. <laughs> wow. Which is fortunate, okay. actually. In the, in the, in the, well, I postman probably doesn't think it's fortunate. But, um, yeah, in the UK at the moment, uh, it's a good excuse for actually getting out and do, doing an hour of exercise every day. That's, the, that's the a big dog, right? He is, yeah. He's about 70 kilos. Um, but fortunately, oh, he doesn't need boy. too much exercise. <laughs> so, yeah. That means you have to carry around big, uh, big plastic bags and a little shovel. A big shovel, but yes, uh, you're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay then. Well, won't we'll dwell on without dwelling on that too long. Uh, okay. Let's get to the next. Yes. So, Phil. Yeah. Please. Well, you know, this all started with the agile movement, and um, you know, the thing about agile is that it doesn't mention testing anywhere in the. Um, 
in, in the manifesto, nor does it mention quality anywhere. So I'm always thinking to myself, you know, where does the quality reside? Where does the testing reside? And as you know, everyone is responsible for quality. So um, I'm always looking at these, uh, the manifesto and trying to really understand how we can interpret it to manifest quality. So where is testing as you know, as you can see it's on the upper right within the daily scrum where everybody discusses where test what should be prioritized what uh, features need to be worked on what blocking issues there are uh, what defects were found that particular day and so on and the thing is how does this all get worked into the entire process starting from sprint planning and the backlog as well as review and so on the testing as you know in agile is is done throughout the process but a lot of times it only shows up in a certain little piece so what we're going to be talking about today is how to implement agile with a lot of the testing i guess you could say mindset of quality implemented throughout and how we're going to implement that uh, within JIRA as well. So and you notice I mentioned JIRA last, and that's because really we have to get JIRA to fit with what we're doing rather than just kind of taking a tool first approach. So Chris, I'm going to be typing just go in the um, chat box there so you can see. Okay, so here are some of the issues that we have with test management and an agile, agile development methodology. You know, a lot of folks wonder whether or not we should have test cases at all. Maybe we should just do all ad hoc testing. And, of course, sometimes you have great user stories. Other times you don't. And in Agile, we've kind of changed the terminology from requirements to user stories, right? But there's still, there's still requirements. Uh, and they should be linked to test cases. How are you going to test requirements? So user stories need to be to be worked in with test cases. And then, you know, in real life, we do test cycles, right? So we may uh, do a certain set of tests, or we may assign certain sets of tests to certain people, or we may have certain tests that are run on some platforms but not others. So we all have to we have to think about that and how we're gonna how we actually implement that um, not only within our process but within the tools that we use and of course there's a lot of reporting you know reporting is very very important um, I've heard it said before that our job in QA is to provide information provide information on whether or not you know the software is ready to pro provide information on the probability that users will find big problems and so on and we can only do that through accurate reporting and discovery of information part of that of course is being able to find out what defects uh, are found in what places in user stories and be able being able to connect that all together and then the last thing in our JIRA process, in our Agile process is, as I said earlier in that graphic, was integrating testing into the sprints throughout the sprint, not just at the end. Because as you know, um, if we try to do all the testing at the end, we just never catch up and we're always in the catch up mode. So let's talk about putting quality into Agile starting from the beginning. Uh, and that means going into requirements and user stories. So we have the valuable software, and this is just directly uh, taken out of the Agile Manifesto, valuable software achieved through satisfying the customer. And so what we have to think about is, okay, so who is the customer? So that means that the user stories are critical in satisfying the customer, and we have the valuable software piece, which you know, valuable is a, is a big word, but we can go into that a little bit later in terms of actually satisfying the customer and implementing those user stories that are the most important first. And of course, we've got changing requirements and regular intervals. Regular intervals being what we call iterations or sprints. And then changing requirements. Uh, previously with waterfall, as you know, sometimes you get to the end and the requirements would change and then you say, oh, we have to start over again and so on. And that's why we do use regular intervals or sprints to handle 
those changing requirements. And so in real life, cha requirements change or user stories change over time as things are understood better. But the thing is that how do we implement and track those changing requirements within the tools that we use? And we're going to learn some of that today. Okay, so as you may know, epics and stories, stories are part of epics. Epics are a high-level requirement that could contain many stories. And this really enables us to break down our work and break down our thoughts and enables us to define tasks within a story and assign those out because you don't want to have tasks or work units that go too big. Otherwise, it doesn't facilitate you breaking it down and really understanding it in detail. So let's look at a, as a, at a user story and try to break it down and analyze it. So we want to, I'm sure that everybody has seen this before, but I, so I won't go into it in detail. But the, I think the main point is that you're taking a look at this from the user's perspective and that you're explaining the value or benefit from the user's perspective. So what do they, what do they get out of it um, and what is the outcome? What I want to really achieve. A lot of times as a developer, you may want to implement something and unless you're really knowledgeable and think from the end user's point of view in terms of what they want to achieve, you may satisfy the actual quote unquote requirement or a user story, but not actually get done what you what the user wants to get done. So here's some examples. Um, you notice that in the last if you didn't have the I want if you just had the I want to sell 50 shares of stock then you wouldn't have the understand that they want to get money in their account and getting the money in the account is would be the objective so you have to implement the whole thing and the same thing about counting people that comes to your website you want to understand the entire objective of the user story so that you can implement it correctly so now i'm going to turn it over to chris chris is going to talk about how to develop an epic and user stories within JIRA, and of course using Zephyr. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. So, um, with the, and thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Phil. I think uh, somebody once said to me that requirements are the root of all evil, <laughs> and I think there's an element of that. If, if requirements aren't expressed well, um, or at least in a way that all stakeholders, including developers and business users, can understand, it is therefore very difficult to actually develop the correct solution that delivers the business uh, needs. So language and how it's stored is really, really important. Um, what I'm showing you here is this, this is really the beginning of creating requirements that we're all familiar with. And for those of, you are, those of who whom are familiar with JIRA, you will be used to seeing this. This is regular JIRA software functionality. So our requirements in this case are held in Zephyr, in JIRA, I'm sorry, and the Zephyr part will come later. Now, an epic is a large piece of work, just typically too large to go into a set of stories, maybe slightly vague, maybe slightly undefined, but it can be useful to gather things together. Different people can actually uh, define it slightly differently. Okay, but I think everyone can agree on the fact it tends to span several stories. And also it may actually span several releases. Uh, in this particular case, we've got a couple of stories relating to this epic. Uh, one in progress and one to do. Now, as Phil has said, a story should be written in a way that connotes the requirements. And we've tried to do this with these two stories. Uh, so the way Jira um, basically exposes this, and this is the server version we're using, um, it creates a link to the underlying stories, which are associated with the epic. And the epic is just talking about work management in, generally, in general. And the two issues are, as a Jira user, I want to create a subtask for a story so I can break down work into smaller chunks. Um, it's hopefully an expression of what the user is trying to achieve. And as a user, I want to add story points to stories. Um, these are the two, ep two stories that are currently in the pipeline that relate to the epic. Um, later on, we will see how these interact with Zephyr so that we can think about how to test them. Okay, Phil. 
Yeah, so everyone knows that, I, you know, we've been sheltered. We call it sheltering at home. Some folks call it stay uh, work from home. Um, but user stories could not shelter at home, I say, and that's because they really have to go. They cannot be in isolation. They have to go with acceptance criteria. And so unless you have a story that's complemented by acceptance criteria, it's not really a complete story. So let's take a look at, you know, what the what we want to say uh, the definition of done is, because definition of done is one of the uh, one of the difficult things in Agile. So let's take a look at that. So in order to have a definition of done, we have to pass through an acceptance test. So we want to write acceptance tests for each requirement or for each user story. And we want to be able to measure or say that, yes, we got it done, or no, we didn't get it done. And this is the acceptance test would be the condition from the customer on whether or not you were able to complete that particular feature or functionality. And it must be, it must accompany uh, a user story. If you don't have that acceptance test or what consists of done, then really you have a very incomplete user story. So let's go into some of the things in terms of acceptance criteria and done or not done, uh, pass or fail. Chris, can you go through some of that? Uh, yeah, no, uh, sure. So um, the way we can implement acceptance criteria or, or testing, so to give us that definition of done, um, if you're using a tool such as Zephyr, uh, we can create test cases, and they're really the vehicle for achieving this. So the story holds the requirement, and the test case holds uh, the acceptance criteria, if you like. Um, and in, when we set these up with Zephyr for JIRA, they are in fact a type, a special type of issue called test, which comes when you install the Zephyr plugin. Uh, you can document descriptions of your tests and what you know what the overall objective is you can have attachments you can have uh, custom fields and so forth because they are in fact native Jira issues um, additionally uh, you can also have test steps which indicate um, stages that people have to go through to in to determine whether this test is going to be passed successfully so what you're looking at right now uh, is a test uh, called if it Given an existing story, a Jira user can add a new subtask to it. So it fits with the story we previously talked about. We're describing that users should be able to add new subtasks. And in the two steps, we're describing the actions you should be able to take and the outcomes you should get. Now, it's important to save that information because later on, we will show you how you execute that and you can actually record and report on the results of whether this acceptance criteria or test case is being met by the developed solution. So that expected result is put into the into the test case as part of um, absolutely as part of the test case itself. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Plus, even you know, supporting attachments um, if you if you mm -hmm. like, and then as you execute them, and we'll see this later on, you can have different execution statuses for each step and an overall status for the test case. Um, now, would it be possible to show a in the expected results an actual picture of what you expect, or is that not at, possible? It's an interesting um, uh, no <laughs> attachment. You okay. Put it in the attachment, yeah. basically. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's an interesting uh, thought. Um, oh, I should say, Phil, actually, because we've not covered it anywhere, you can import these things in from spreadsheets, so you can make it easier mm. to get your data in. Okay. 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 Yeah, just getting back to acceptance criteria, you can include functional criteria, just as Chris was talking about in terms of that particular user story and test case, which implemented a certain functionality. But there's, of course, as you may know, of the non-functional requirements and performance criteria that also could be part of the, um, not only the user story, but also needs to be part of the acceptance test. So in terms of user stories, they don't all have to be, you know, I press this button and I get the report or, or so on, but could also be non-functional type user stories where a user um, can implement what they want to do within a certain performance criteria, 
uh, and get a certain response time. That could also be a user story so that you don't forget about those important non-functional requirements uh, that somehow seem to be addressed only at the end of a project. Hmm. That's a great point, yeah. Yeah. And so um, when you have that clear uh, clear pass and fail result, what you want to do is you want to make that at the right level of granularity such that there are no partial acceptance. Either it's passed or it doesn't pass. And if if you have a criteria that is, oh, well, it's it's almost there, or this part of it was done but not that part, that means you need to break that down into smaller, that's indication that you need to break that down into smaller pieces in order to add certainty in terms of what is done and what is not done and what piece is good or not good. So just think about that when you're doing a test and if it's only partially pass, then that test and that criteria needs to be broken down into a smaller piece. So um, just talking a little bit more about acceptance criteria. Acceptance criteria is just in an intent but not an actual solution. So if you look at these two examples here, you know, we don't want to mention uh, radio buttons or any particular way that something is implemented. Rather, we want to just uh, implement, uh, show the criteria that is independent of an actual implementation or button or box or something like that. Uh, lastly, about acceptance criteria, you want to have some types of standards and writing acceptance criteria. So within your organization, if you have multiple people writing acceptance criteria and user stories, then you want to have a certain format so that everybody understands the terminology, terminology that's being used and um, kind of uh, makes them independent of the particular person that's writing them so that everybody, if you have some transitions within the organization, that way any new person coming in can clearly and quickly understand the user story and what its intention is. And it's also important to think about acceptance tests. Like I said before, we have the functional acceptance tests or functional user stories, but you can also have user stories that are implemented from a, a more holistic point of view from a user's goals of getting an entire task done. So don't keep your user stories small just on the functionality, as Chris was showing in his example about implementing a certain particular function, but also a user story could be all the way through a particular path through the software where the user gets an end result. And so this would be more like a user acceptance test, which also translates into a, a more complex user story. So both of those things can be included as user stories and have their own definitions of done. I know I said a lot there. I hope uh, made sense. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, so we want to have user stories that are pulled into each iteration or each sprint and have acceptance criteria that go with these user stories. And then also we need to think about who is the acceptance testing or who are these user stories being tested by and who gets to accept them. And so that's important to think about in terms of when you actually finish your iteration or finish your sprint and you go to the demonstration with your users or your product owner and you say, oh, look, it's done. And they say, oh, well, that's not done. And so um, you need to think about how can you understand their acceptance a little bit better to make your user story and criteria better. I'll let you go and show how we can connect these all these things together, Chris. <laughs> Excellent. You so, got a tough job. <laughs> well, um, we discussed whether to do this with a live demo or presentation or screenshots, and I have gone with screenshots because when you're using mm -hmm. a browser-based app, you can get a lot of tabs quite quickly. Um, so also forgive me if you're not seeing the level of detail and the work through that you might like. If anyone wants to discuss mm. afterwards how that how things are actually done, we will of course show you. Um, use stories with tests. Um, 
as Phil has talked about, you know, we want the story to describe, you know, the intention of what we're going to develop. And the tests really contain the acceptance criteria, the steps, the expected results. And they need to be linked with the user story for traceability so we can see what stories have got what tests. Um, how that is achieved with Zephyr plugin is it uses the built-in Jira links. So in this particular case, um, I've got my story here, which is as a Jira user, I want to create a subtask for a story. Um, I've highlighted a few things here. We can see the issue type is story. It's part of the work management epic. I know what sprint it's currently in. I've got a description of it. And it actually links to two tests. And we can see here the little Zephyr logo indicating these are associated test cases. So I can see here there are two test cases associated with this story. Um, later on in the presentation, it's a few slides time, we'll actually show you the traceability report, um, which is quite a nice way of seeing across many stories and tests exactly what your coverage is and how stories and tests are related together. We had a question come in just now, Chris, about uh, running these or executing these stories and test cases against different platforms. So let's say in one, uh, this week we want to test it against uh, you know the, the mobile side and then the, the following week you have another test cycle that goes against uh, you know, Chrome or something like that. Are you going to be talking about that? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. We will indeed be talking about that uh, later during test cycles. Um, okay. Suffice to say that each test case <clears throat> can be associated with many different test cycles. This allows us, you know, the idea that a test can be executed several times mm. in different contexts. The cycle is also the way we group together tech, uh, tests maybe for the end of a sprint, maybe for regression, maybe for functional, maybe for UAT. So it has the concept mm -hmm. of groups of tests or potentially the same tests but for different environments. Something we've done ourselves when you ship Jira plugins, if you're supporting Jira 7 and Jira 8, you tend to end up with different versions of the plugin, of the code, but of course you want the same outcome. So it works very so effectively. Instance, yeah. So for instance, you could see whether a particular test case uh, for instance, you could see, okay, this particular test case, BDQ XBO5, mm -hmm. was successful on these five platforms but failed on Firefox or something like that. Uh, absolutely right, yeah. And um, okay. we will see exactly that in, uh, in a few a few slides Great. time. Fantastic. So we'll uh, table that question for a few seconds here. Um, yeah, one more thing on acceptance tests, you know, we, of course, we want them to be reusable and independent, and that gets back to making them smaller. Remember, we were talking about that, such that you have good pass-fail criteria, yes or no. And then in terms of reusability, you know, if you follow a good um, format and standard within your organization in writing user stories, then it makes them, it certainly makes them a lot more reusable than if everybody's writing user stories in different ways. And of course, you want to also write our user stories with automation in mind. So a lot of times we may have flags on user stories and whether or not, when the person is writing them, whether or not they think that they should be going into a automated regression test or not. And whether or not that goes into a smoke test and so on, because there are certain types of tests that you certainly want to run all the time upon code check-in. That's very good. We, we could uh, extend Jira, for example, with some uh, custom fields. So that'd be more easy to categorize those types right. of stories. Right, right, because you, you otherwise you, you've got, you know, a thousand test cases and you say, okay, well, which ones should I run for, you know, uh, for smoke tests, well, you know, how, how are you going to pick out from a thousand? Very difficult. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Okay. All right. So we have another another problem. As as I mentioned earlier, in uh, today we're talking about changing requirements. We welcome them, right? So let's let's take a look at how we how we welcome changes. So we want to. We want to take a snapshot of the existing requirements and develop against that, but we don't want, so we want to keep that record 
uh, of what we're developing against, but also at the same time enable user stories to change over time because as as we get an understanding of the user story and the way that it's implemented, it may change. So let's take a look at how we can have a snapshot and also how we can keep adapting and uh, morphing the user story to make it better. Uh, of course, you know, user stories, they should be uh, broken down into tasks and we definitely want to stick to two things. One of them is that we want to stick to um, quality and timeline and uh, keep the features within a particular uh, uh, sprint flexible. So let's let's move on, uh, Chris. I think we're already at 32 minutes here. We're getting we got to get going. We got to um, yeah exactly. Why don't, you, why don't you go on here? Okay. Well, just to quickly cover off that that story is changing. Um, in Jira, uh, Jira is not a version control system in and of itself. Um, stories. Um, You've got two. You've got two th ways of considering change. Um, there is the activity or history tab on stories, so that actually you can see if they have been changed in the context of a sprint. Uh, you can also see uh, if you add or remove stories from a sprint, which ideally you don't, but it will happen. That will change the scope of the overall sprint, which will impact your overall scope reporting. Um, so you, you may say you've got a baseline of stories, which are the chosen stories you initiate the sprint with. But in terms of the requirements, um, in JIRA as a whole, your, your baseline essentially is you can check the activity or watch it to see if anybody has changed it after the sprint has started. Now, if that is not uh, adequate, and it is for most people because you know, you're doing two weeks chunks, if that's not adequate, one of our other partners does have a tool, it's called RMSYS, which is a very formal requirements management system where you can really freeze requirements and freeze versions quite often popular with engineering companies actually um, so if the baseline in the is not enough there are options to make it more robust but of course with that comes more process okay so let's getting back to what we discussed earlier about being able to trace all the way from requirements or user stories to uh, yeah. defects yeah, let's uh, let's uh, I can sort of press on. Let's go on and press on there, Chris. Absolutely. Talk so about the I think the traceability matrix is really important to be able to show how things are all connected together. Exactly. Picture paints a thousand words, doesn't it? So those issue links, uh, the way we linked stories earlier with test cases. Um, here we can see one of the traceability matrix. It's a special report that Zephyr can generate for you. And it's possible to see how stories actually map through from, you know, from requirements, which is what they are, to their associated test cases and to the executions of those test cases. Uh, we're going to cover the executions themselves in the next couple of slides. Now, if you like, take a look at the BDQ XBO2 story, uh, you can see that it has two test cases associated with it. And in the next window, we can actually see how many times those test cases have been executed and what the results of those are. Furthermore, if there are any defects, any bugs have been raised by the testers against those test cases when they're executed, those would show up in the defects pane. So we have traceability all the way through from the story through to the test cases through to the executions of those test cases, through to defects raised while they're being executed. Wow, that's great. That's uh, nice, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so let's just yeah. talk. Oh, sorry, Phil. Yeah, yeah. just yeah, just to go on to the next slide. I was, we're going to dive into how you, uh, in reality, we want to plan tests and create a test plan, just like the old-fashioned way, but actually thinking about how to implement test plans within sprints and test cycles across different platforms. That's absolutely right. Let's, um, let's have a look at how we can achieve this with Zephyr's test cycles. So a test cycle is a, is a group of test cases that you want to execute. So a test case can be executed many different times in different test cycles. And here's a good example, I, I hope. Uh, it's um, we use this technique ourselves for managing, as I say, one of our plugins, which has to have two simultaneous releases. It's either that or it's having a load of conditional stuff in the code. So in this particular example, we've got um, a browser cycle, an iOS cycle, and an Android cycle. We want the same set of tests to be run against mm -hmm. these three different environments. 
and that's how we determine whether it gets shipped or not. And I will, I can see here that the state of these different test sets, although it's got the same test cases, is in fact different for the different environments for a given release. So that, in this case, it tells me very quickly that my general browser-based one for functional testing is okay and partly finished. My iOS one has half has passed, half has failed, and Android, everything has failed. And right now, I've actually got the iOS um, test cycle selected, and I can actually see here the detail of what's happened within that test cycle. And I can see which particular, um, I can see the results against the actual test cases, the high level test results. So I can see here one's passed and one's failed. And naturally, I can dive into these test cases and executions to get more information about what's actually happened. Just in case you're dialed in from the United States, uh, iOS, and Chris, we usually say iOS, just, <laughs> just FYI. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just, just beating your chops. Sorry about that. Keep going. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> too, I've said too many osses in the past, I think that's the problem. Um, this is, we've talked about, Actually, okay, test cycles are good. You know, we, and we, a test cycle is a concept of executing a series of tests and, you know, quite often done regression time, for example, or for particular contexts. One of the ways we can try and help in an agile context, as you said, Phil, is do a cycle in a sprint, maybe many cycles. But here we've gone with Zephyr. I'm showing you Zephyr's quite nifty sprint view board, which is integrated into the Jira backlog. Um, so for this sprint we're currently on, the BDQ XBO sprint, um, I can actually see the stories within the sprint and I can actually also see the test cases that relate to that story and their status. So right now what we're looking at is I've got a sprint, I've got a story, that story's got two test cases, one's been passed and one has yet to be unexecuted and one has yet to be executed. So this gives that starts to give us this gate check. At the end of a sprint, I can see in one place my stories, test cases, and their results. So have my stories actually undergone a proper formal acceptance criteria within the sprint? That's what we're seeing here. And my final uh, thing I was going to mention uh, is actually just the test execution itself. Some of you might be saying, well, actually, how on earth do we execute these tests? And if you're thinking that, you're right, I've not gone into that full screen yet. And here it is. There's many other screens and there's reporting as well, but also we've, <laughs> we've only got hmm, 45 minutes. Um, this is the test execution. We've got this information in front of us. Okay, Everything you need is at your fingertips. So you know the test case and the cycle. And at the moment, we're in the uh, IOS. There we go. <laughs> I think. Uh, IOS testing cycle, functional testing for sprint one. Um, I can see the actual uh, test case and the description of the test case. I've got a link back to the actual original story. Um, and I've actually got the test steps in front of me. So I can just, as a tester, um, I sound like I'm actually reading a story out, but as a tester now, I can actually read this test case, go through my steps, set the statuses as described, set the overall status, and then just simply move on to the next step, next test and execute it. And these results will build up into those cycles we've discussed or shown before okay and there's a, there's a bunch of things in here you can see I can see the individual steps test data the expected result any attachments like images to help me see what they think should have happened I can create some comments I can attach things maybe there's a horrible bug I want to stick it in um, or indeed I can attach it to or uh, create a new defect a JIRA bug which you could then stick back in your agile workflow anyway Hmm. that's a quick run through of how you actually execute a test and you would go through that for is several it, tests. Yeah. Is it possible to see which test step failed? Is that part of the, part of the test case? Uh, it's just, just it's just down here actually. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. You've got, uh, you've got the two statuses there. You, you mm -hmm. can have an individual status for each um, step. And actually in some of the reports, there is a tiny little widget actually, which does show you, um, how many passed and how many failed, basically within the right. report. Um, so if you dive in, but if you dive in, you know, if you've got an overall fail, let's say on one of your tests, you can dive into it and find out exactly what's happened. Sure, that's good. Thanks. No problem. So let's uh, let's sum it up here, huh? So let's 
you know, I think that we've covered quite a bit today. I'm just going to sum it up on the next two slides in terms of um, what we'd like you to take away. Maybe you got some peripheral information as well. Next one, Chris. Yeah, so, you know, um, in the beginning, we I put up the graphic about the Agile uh, methodology and the cycle, and we hope that you've, what you've gotten out of this is that we need to think about quality from from multiple angles, getting the users involved, working with developers and testers, working to, together to develop criteria, acceptance criteria, and developing a common understanding together. So that's really important these days with working remote. And so we need to have lots of these, uh, you know, screen sharing sessions with each other developers and testers working through criteria, screen shares, and so on. And um, I know we all get tired of these Zoom and uh, go to meetings, but it's really necessary. And as testers, we need to work together in uh, working in with the sprint and using test cycles and spreading out our effort according to where it needs to go to the most. And of course, um, I think we mentioned earlier about some Folks say that test cases are not necessary, but without user stories and criteria for accepting those user stories as done or not done, then that implies that you have to have some kind of a test case anyway. So it's really the level of granularity and detail of the test case. You still need to have a test to go against uh, a user story, whether or not you're done or not done. And that's up to your organization and the type of granularity that you need. And actually, Phil, I'd like to add a, add a point actually to that. I've, I have seen a few customers, as they transitioned from waterfall to agile, um, their concept of testing actually did basically disappear. It mm. pretty much stopped happening. Um, oh. Yeah, it did. Because I think some of the problems you, you issues you raised, there was a formal uh, division previously where they did their requirements and they had their tests, they're probably using prints, they were using waterfall. And when they went to Agile, there was very much an emphasis on stories and agility and self-determination. But the testing, as you've, as you've said, there's not necessarily per se anything specific about testing the Agile manifesto. And um, yeah, it, the concept of testing literally got lost. Uh -huh. And um, I, I was speaking to testers and said, yeah, we, we don't really have a test phase now. We don't really know what to do. Right, um, right. That, these, some of these were not small companies. So uh, I sure. think, think some of the points you're making here are really good. It's like maybe how do you trend, if you're going transitioning to agile from waterfall, actually how do you still take some form of formalized testing over to make sure, yeah, your cadences are shorter, but you've still developed the right thing and it works. Very, very important. Right. Well, the QA folks have to move um, upstream into the user stories, and like I said, the user stories imply that you have done and not done, which implies testing. So that's important to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one more slide before we finish up today, and I think um, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but in terms of working out your sprints and the user stories that are included in each sprint, it's important not, to not go too far out because we did mention that user stories will change a lot and you forget and so on. And also you want to cut down on the amount of writing you do, right, in terms of writing the test cases or writing the user stories, which may change. So it's important to only do a couple sprints out as far as those user stories go. I did talk about working together. Uh, with developers and testers, making sure that stories are testable, meaning that you have criteria that are broken down in small enough chunks that you have yes or no, pass or fail. And this enables you to, as you go through your stories, to really think through them more carefully rather than having just uh, epic type level stories. Um, and I hope you, you've learned from Chris today how to connect your defects to your stories and how to have full transparency and traceability so that you can understand what stories failed or what requirements were failed. And that's really, at a deeper level, you can try to look at what types of requirements or what types of stories 
usually have failures. And what we found with different organizations is that, you know, it may be certain um, functionality that's always seems to be cloudy, that needs uh, more work and requirements, or um, you may have specific non-functional things that tend to fail. And lastly, we hope that you've seen today how to implement these kinds of concepts with Jira and Zephyr. Yeah, that's really great. I, I think if you can't write any form of testing for a requirement, that may indicate your requirement needs a bit more work. Mm. That's uh, right. It's yeah, a good, so. good, good rule of thumb because you may, if you, if it's not testable, it may not actually be implementable either. Yep. Okay, so the last slide really just says, uh, you know, thanks to all you folks for attending today. You know, if you want to reach out to us, feel free. Here's all of our stuff in terms of where you can find both XBOsoft and BDQ Cloud. That's right. Uh, many thanks for your time, Phil. It's a really, really interesting um, discussion there on yeah. testing. Yeah, it's great to be here and great to uh, be able to work together, Chris. Thanks very much for inviting me. That's an absolute pleasure. Uh, Phil says, if you've got any questions, please reach out to us. Uh, you can see how to get hold of us, xbosoft.com or bdq.cloud. Reach out with any questions, and you'll get a copy of this uh, webinar recording afterwards. Alrighty. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. All the best. Thanks. Bye.